What's up, everybody? How's it going? It's Tuesday again, so it's time for another Tactical Tuesday. Um, I thought we'd talk about something a little bit different today uh, than the normal Tactical Tuesday fair. I wasn't really sure what to talk about because uh, there's not a lot going on right now. We could keep talking about Tyranids, which I'm sure a lot of people would like, but we've, we've covered a lot of the Codex, and I have a lot of more videos planned out, which we'll cover a lot more. And uh, I keep playing them on Throwdown Thursday, so if we want to talk about Tyranids, we can do that on Thursdays and over on the uh, Twitch stream. So I figured we would take a different tack this week on the regular live stream show, and we would um, cover some ethical play. So this was a uh, topic that... that came up uh, actually out of a Discord discussion a couple of weeks ago where if you're playing one of these uh, factions that is sort of, you know, monumentally overrepresented uh, in terms of its win percentage, what do you do if you're not playing in, th in sort of a competitive tournament format? Because I think there are a lot of communities that are going to... Um, you know, just say straight up, right? Like, I don't want to play against those factions. I don't want to play against the people playing those armies. And I just don't want to see it. And I think that that sucks. <laughs> so uh, what I want to do today is is really go over maybe some ways that we can continue to see these factions get played, not only in a casual format, but also more competitively as well. And, uh, you know, continue to see them on the table, but maybe approach them from a different uh, from a different perspective so that we can try to build them in such a way that they are not quite as much of a negative play experience as possible. Now, what I don't want to do today is tell people to like, A, th like throw out their factions. Don't play, you know, if you like Tau, don't play Tau because people don't like playing against Tau. First of all, the people who are like, I never want to play against Tau, those people are kind of jerks, to be honest. What but, you know, that said, obviously, Tau's super broken and does need to get toned down. And there are some units in Tau that suck to play against, almost regardless of the um, the matchup that you're playing into. So what we want to do today is, is uh, try to construct some guidelines and some builds that we can use to try to play these factions in a different way and make things more interesting. So I, I kind of wanted to um, have this be a little bit of a community discussion, so I have some uh, some interaction with the chat. I have a couple factions here that uh, I'm going to be talking about today, but if we want to continue on, I, I was going to put some honorable mentions into this, um, into uh, the my, my little uh, presentation here, but I didn't have time to do that. So if we want to continue to talk about some of them um, towards the end, we can do that. If anybody has any input on the way we can, the way, you know, the ways we can try to uh, build these factions in a more interesting way, then we can do that as well. But uh, yeah, that's what that's what we're doing today. I want to thank everybody for coming and hanging out with me. We're spamming crew talks. That's a good thing. <laughs> I, I mean, I think uh, crew are, are very good in town, to be fair. Um, so <laughs> I, I don't know if that's the way it goes. Uh, the Tyranids is the only good guys? 100% for sure. Absolutely. Tyranids is just hungry, man. They just wanting, they just want a little snack. <laughs> anyway uh jay bird just finished getting the army up in tts well thanks man come hang out uh, hang out with us in the discord i think we're, we're uh, i got a couple requests for another um new player event over in discord so that's uh, probably what we're going to be looking to do in the next couple weeks so if you are new to 40k or new to tabletop simulator or you just want to get some sort of fun times casual games in um sometime I'll probably have an announcement this week or the next. We'll probably have a startup for that within the next couple of weeks. And, uh, we will, um, be doing that. Those are usually they're 2000 point events. So you're still playing the regular game size, but what we do is we unlock lists so you can play a different list every round. And the idea there is if you're still experimenting or you want to play with different stuff, then you can play around with whatever you want. Um, with the uh, intention that, you know, it's going to be more casual format. So uh, if you're coming in with you know, the, the cutting edge of, of the metagame, you can certainly do that, but I don't know. Maybe don't. <laughs> um, what else do we have going on? We also have uh, Throwdown Thursday that I mentioned before. That's going to be, it looks like Craft Worlds versus Tyranids again this, t this coming time. I'm playing against Steve Pampreen, um, who used to be in uh, 
the same gaming team I was in Gentleman Gaming. I don't know if he's on a gaming team right now, but uh, that, that should be a fun game. I'm excited to play Steve, and uh, it's going to be good. It's interesting that we keep getting the same matchup, but it's always different players. <laughs> so, uh, do I think the new uh, Tyranid Codex will be included in the next Data Slate nerfs? No, it's not even out yet. <laughs> Uh, it's, uh, I think we do have a concrete date for the release date. April 16th is the Tyranny Codex release date. So we're still all just under two weeks away from the actual release. And we would see a data slate for it, you know, two to three weeks after that at the earliest. So I don't think we see any changes to the Tyranny Codex, um, between now and at least, uh, May. So that's what I would expect. Uh, is my focus here more for f smaller RTTs and play nights? Or are we talking about broader GT formats? I mean, I don't want, really want to pigeonhole the discussion. I think that it's going to be a good discussion if you want to uh, play more interesting games of 40k at every level. What I don't want to do, like I said before, is you know discount entire factions. But also, I don't want to say, like, don't play good stuff. Because even if you're playing casually... Not only is playing, like, if you just hamstring yourself to play garbage, it's not very fun. <laughs> Maybe that's me speaking personally, but if my army just sort of doesn't work on a fundamental level, I'm not going to have a good time with it. And your opponents are also aware when you are playing a bad army list against them, right? Like, if if you're, if you're playing a, an army that just does nothing then your your opponents are also not going to have the greatest time. So uh, I know that we can certainly talk about this in terms of casual gaming and, and smaller RTTs and stuff, but I would, what I would like to do is also talk about some functional lists that you can play that are less, uh, sort of less negative play experience than um, the, the, you know, the top edge of the metagame. Uh, because I do think that there are interesting ways that you can build armies so that they are interactive and that they fight with the, your opponent and that there's like an interesting back and forth to the game, even though the army is still powerful. Probably not going to be the same as, you know, the su a super duper hardcore death army, but uh, that's certainly going to still be pretty reasonable. They published Custodia's buffs a couple days after the Codex came out. I mean, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> I think that was I, I have to imagine that that was a, a, a special case, though. Uh, and that was also because the, the Custodes Codex was delayed significantly. And it doesn't seem to me like this Tyranids Codex is delayed. It looks like the whole spoiler season for Tyranids... I mean, it, it was essentially released early. It was almost the opposite of delayed because it leaked. But uh, it seems to me that the, um, the, the release window for Tyranids was right where it was planned to be. Whereas Custodes got pushed back like a whole month. So they might have had changes in mind for a data slate soon after the Custodes Codex was released that didn't happen because they uh, pushed it back. New Tyranids are probably not broken at a competitive level. We'll have to see. I do think that they are going to be very strong. I wasn't... Um, I wasn't I wasn't sure, sure about them when I saw the spoilers, but I do think that they are going to be super strong. And that's why they're on this list uh, in the, the factions I want to talk about. Do we get a day run and rata to Tyranid Forge World units? I would 100% 100% expect that. Usually, two to three days after the Codex releases, usually we get the uh, Forge World errata. I don't know what they're going to change with all that stuff. I imagine that the changes are pretty, um, pretty low key for tier for the Tyranid Forge World. I, I, I don't know if there are any abilities that they really have to give them, because they didn't really add like army wide abilities, right? To the to, to the Tyranid Codex. Might just be stat ch stat line changes. I would like to see Crusher Stampede go away and minus one damage built into Hyrule Duels, though. Because they do need something to make up for their 18 wounds. Or they get dropped to 17 wounds. Oh, that'd be awesome. Do I think Tyranids will be as or more powerful in Harlequins? Definitely not as powerful as Harlequins. But I do think that they will be um, probably, like, Tau level. They're not going to suck as much to play against as Tau, because Tau is like, I sit on my table edge and I shoot. You know, a good Tau list is like double broadside, like double crisis suit or whatever. And they just like turn one deep strike on you and then shoot you with smart missiles and rail guns and that you're hopefully your army's dead. Uh, and Tyranids don't do that. Tyranids fight. <laughs> we have a big fight with you. But I do think that the like their, their units are statistically, you know, as powerful as Tau units. So uh, I, I don't think that they're going to be like a game-breakingly good when they come out, but I do think that they are going to be certainly GT-winningly good when they come out. I would expect to see a lot of 
um, a lot of GT stuff come out. They need Hive Tendril. Oh, that's true, chat. Yeah, they need they need the Hive Tendril keyword rather than the High Fleet keyword. Oh no, they have the High Fleet keyword. They need Hive Tendril to differentiate them from Gene Stealer Cult. I'm with you, chat. I like that there is an actual faction keyword for them. Would like to see Barb Tyrell go to three damage. Uh, could you imagine? <laughs> oh my god. I think if anything, Barb Tyrell would go to AP3. I don't think it would go to three damage, though. Three damage would be insane. That gun would be wild. <laughs> <laughs> Barb Tyrodol in every list. Throw your Exocrines out, everybody. Take Barb Tyrodols. Uh, I guess the the comparison with the Exocrines still not great for Barb Tyrodol. They don't even recover. They're only AP three. They're only AP two versus the AP four on the Exocrine. They're one, one damage less, but they shoot three more times. I don't know. I don't know. All right. So let's talk about some concepts that I want to uh, be talking about today. So here's some stuff that sucks in for in four hundred forty k. Mostly stuff that's uninteractable from your opponent. So stuff like aircraft, you can't charge it. Oftentimes, if you don't have super long range guns, which are kind of, I don't know, that depends on the faction. You may or may not have access to them. You can't do anything to them turn one. And then they do stuff to you turn one, and that sucks. So w one thing that we want to sort of keep in mind is that like hardcore alpha strikes right out of the gate are just poopy. If you show up to a game and you're like, okay, let's play a good game of 40K, and then your opponent's like, oops, I kill all your stuff immediately. And you're like, well, this sucks. Why am I, why am I here? <laughs> what am I doing here? Um, so that's like things like aircraft and artillery. Uh, if we're trying to, to play 40K in kind of a more fair manner, I think uh, those are two of the ones that you want to take out. Turn one deep strikes is another one that I, I think is maybe a personal pet peeve of mine. So this is things like drop pods and tyrannocytes and homing beacons off of Tau Empire, where you, and and to a lesser extent, like Veil of Darkness and stuff like that, repositional effects uh, that can trigger on turn one. Deep striking as a mechanic is sort of predicated on your opponent having counterplay to it. So, like, you can only you can't set up within nine inches of enemies. Uh, you your opponent has the the chance to screen you out and stuff. And for normal deep strikes and strategic reserves, your opponent has a chance to, like, they get a movement phase to move and and position their screens. Now, obviously, those are are usually better going first because you get two movement phases to try to counteract their screening, and you get a chance to kill their screens before your deep strikers come in. But your opponent still has something to do, and they can try to play very defensively and make you know make castles, protect their screens so that they can run out turn one. Uh, against turn one deep strikes, none of that applies. If you go first and you have drop pods in your list or drop pod mechanics, there is nothing your opponent can do. They have to have set up assuming that your drop pods are coming down. And some factions, and speaking as somebody who played Tyranids, the 8th edition Tyranid Codex, which had no forward deploy outside of one crappy stratagem, uh, there was ob there was typically nothing you could do to stop a turn one deep strike from, from railing you. Um, and it's not to say that that's, like, in most cases, and especially now that there's so many redeploys and, and forward deploys and stuff like that in the game, that's not to say that it's necessarily, like, game-breaking. But it does suck, and sometimes it just ends games of 40k immediately, and that's lame. <laughs> um, next up, untarget ability, so bodyguard mechanics and stuff like that. Those also are just kind of lame in some armies. Uh, if they aren't sort of perfectly constructed, can't don't, 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 they can't deal with it. Uh, especially if they're not also themselves bring it, bring, building a lot of artillery and things like that. If you're hiding behind a bodyguard and they can't indirect fire you and you're, it's out of line of sight, there's nothing you can do, so that's GG. Uh, but what we want to sort of encourage is interactive play. So I I talk a lot about how there is kind of a platonic ideal of Warhammer 40,000, which is sort of exemplified by, uh, in my opinion, the regular Space Marine army, right? So there's like a foot, it's like a foot salamander's army. I always, this is the meme army in, in my head. Um, it's a... It's a space marine army that's constructed of like intercessors and aggressors and like blade guard veterans and some eradicators or something. And it deploys on the line and it moves forward towards your opponent. It has a shooting phase and then it sees if it's a charge range. It's probably not because it's all slow. And then your opponent moves and they shoot at it and you have like a bunch of defensive effects so you don't take much damage. And then you move up again and you shoot and then you charge. And that's how like 40k from its inception was, was sort of meant to be played without all of this like chicanerous effects. So what we want to do is try to encourage that style of play. Now, different factions approach it differently 
necessarily. It's not going to be the same in every faction. But generally speaking, the concept is that if you attack your opponent, they then have a chance to attack you back. And that is what makes 40k a more fun and interesting game. Uh, whether or not you actually take damage from those attacks, that's the other question. So building defensive combos into your list and, and you know building with dedicated transports and stuff like that to try to make it difficult for your opponent to kill you makes the game more interesting and, and uh, interactive, but at least that there's attacks going back and forth uh, over the course of the game. Rules that turn off opponent special rules as well. New nids. Uh, turn off Blood Angels plus one to wound. I don't know. I think, I think rules that sort of specifically turn off opponent's rules is is something to, to keep in mind. So if you have like an anti-aura ability, right? And your opponent's army is just like randomly predicated on auras. That's kind of a feel bad. Those are pretty few and far between. But statistical, like th there's almost nothing you can do about, um, uh, I like to call those um, uh, uh, profile mismatches where your opponent has attacks that are randomly not good into your profiles. And there's like, that's just sometimes how factions work, right? You're like, oh, my army is all strength seven, two damage, right? I'm like playing Imperial Guard. I got a bunch of Hydras and Ogren or Bulgren, I guess. And my and I randomly hit like triple Telemon Dreadnought. And I'm like, cool. So you're exactly the toughest value. It's for me to wound you on fives and your front line is minus one damage. Like that sucks. And that's unfortunately part of 40K. That's just going to happen. Part of... Part of the metagame is trying to uh, include different profiles in your list building so that you don't get hit with those those profile mismatches, but sometimes it just happens. And sometimes you're like, well, my my army wounds on twos, but their army only gets wounded on fours. And you're like, oh, well, you know, whatever. <laughs> it It is what it is. Uh, one CP reroll everything versus your faction. Yeah, that stuff is a little bit hard. That, that's a little annoying. I, I I think it's fine because it's so few and far between. And typically, they, fortunately, they have been toning it down so it's melee only. So against armies that have that capability, you can try to, like, couch your melee and try not to get touched by them too hard. Um, but, I mean, it, it, is, it is what it is. I sort of wish they had more interesting effects for those kind of fluffy stratagems. But I... I also kind of like that they're included in the game. I like that no longer are abilities like that um, special rules. So it used to be like in the old Craft Worlds Codex, right? They, everyone had a special rule um, against Slanesh. You would you you would you would reroll to hit in melee, but you got minus two leadership when you were engaged by them. I think was the was the thing, um, and. I like I, I I think that mechanic was interesting, but but being stapled to the, the data sheet was like difficult to remember. People forgot it all the time, and it was just kind of annoying. So I like that there's stratagems now that are consciously used, but I do agree some of them are a little bit too powerful. Um, the 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 best one was like Old Space Wolves because Thousand Suns for a hot minute were really good, and Old Space Wolves had four rolls against Thousand Suns. <laughs> uh, that was a little silly, but you know it is what it is. Uh, do I feel like baselining terrain expectations might reduce the volume of feel bads on turn one? Uh, I do think that. Um, but I think that, that the way that the 40k community has sort of, you know, evolved, I don't think that it's something that particularly gets... Uh, that, uh, that, that, that would catch on, right? Um, because people have different preferences for terrain. Like personally, um, I I don't like terrain that's like too complex. So so stuff like if you look at WT table, WTC tables, excuse me, right, are like fifteen pieces of terrain, and it's like these, you know, they're all standardized templates, but the setup is very complex, and then the gameplay is super complex. Um, and some people really enjoy that. I think I don't think it adds enough to the game to like 
to to overcome the just the logistical annoyance of playing with like tons of tiny pieces of terrain. And you you got you're knocking them with your arms, and your models are falling off of them, and it's like very annoying. And like personally, I don't like those terrain, but there are hundreds of people in the community that love them. Um, and so I don't know if it's feasible that terrain gets standardized like that. I do like that U.S. Open gave us. Um, you know, essentially what, what GW considers the ideal of a terrain setup. And I do appreciate that a lot of tournaments have started to gravitate that way. Uh, obviously, then we had LVO, and LVO has its player place terrain now. I don't think I like player place terrain. Um, but, you know, if that catches on, then that that would be good. But I, I would appreciate it if, it if it was, like, codified in the rules. I don't know. Um, that's a lot of... <laughs> that's a long answer to a pretty reasonable question the answer is yes i think that 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 uh, standardizing train would help but the uh it, the reality of standardizing train might be a little bit tough artillery should be minus one to hit i think so what do i feel about apocalypse damage rules uh so so uh by the apocalypse damage rules we mean like um hits get applied or hits get received and then applied at the end of the battle round right so both armies get to, per, to to do their turn and then all the casualties get calculated at the same time um i think that that would help quite a bit for sure but i think that changes like that would are structural changes to how 40k works that's something that gets floated a lot right where people are like, oh, well, what we should do is just implement alternating activations to 40k. And then the game would be fixed. And you're like, ah. First off, would it? And then, like, secondly, um, would it? <laughs> like, how does that change how your strategies work and how your statistics work and how everything, you know, works? It's it's too big of a change, I think, to, to really, really, like, discuss reasonably. Um and, and at, at that point, we're talking about an entirely different game. It's not the same game at all. Uh, so let's move on. We talked about the factions that we um, wanted, uh, th that I wanted to go over a little bit uh, over the course of this video. So we have uh, Adeptus Custodes, Craft Worlds, Harlequins, Tau Empire, Tyranids. I think, I mean, it's no, it's no uh, coincidence that these are the five most recent armies in the game. We don't have Gene Steely Cult in here, obviously. <laughs> Um, but I think that, I mean, those are, those are clearly the most powerful. And unfortunately the newer factions tend to have more of these negative play experiences within them. Uh, I touched on a couple other things that I think are, you know, across the board are, um, of all of the factions are going to be sort of raise these problems similarly. So stuff like drop pods and space Marines, stuff like untargetable characters. I think space Marines have some good examples of them, despite the fact that space Marines aren't particularly strong. Uh, from a competitive standpoint, I do think that there are some combos in Space Marines that are annoying to play against. One of them being drop pods, sort of like drop devastator squads and stuff. Another one being um, March of the Ancient Contemptor Dreads, where that can't be targeted by ranged attacks because they're bodyguarded. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, those are <laughs> those are the two. <laughs> uh, and from a competitive standpoint, that's kind of what, what Space Marines are, are built around right now. But um, I don't know if, uh, but we're, we're not talking about competitive play generally. Uh, Andrew, as a Necrons player, recently dealt with a Custodes player putting four characters on one side of his gearing terrain, squad of wardens on the other side, so I couldn't shoot anything and it wasn't fun. Well, let me tell you, Andrew, because uh, our first faction that I have here is Adeptus Custodes, and one of these, one of the units that I call out here <laughs> is Custodian Wardens. So that's a very appropriate, uh, that's a very appropriate call out for those Custodian Wardens. So again, it's Stuff like untargetability effects that are kind of poopy. Oh, I didn't put my little check mark here. We got a little check mark for uh, Custodes guys. Let's give them that check mark. Uh, I do think that it's a little bit different for custodian characters because custodian characters aren't uh, like a unlike a lot of other characters that can be bodyguarded. They aren't range powerhouses, so they. Um, they don't, while they're being untargetable from ranged attacks, they're not really doing anything. Like, a uh, uh, Bike Captain can shoot a Salvo Launcher or whatever, right? And, like, Trajan shoots, like, maybe four times the Strength 5. But they're not, like, tabling your army. Unlike a lot of armies, like Tau or Tyranids, where their characters being bodyguarded have the capability of doing 
absolutely ludicrous damage. Uh, and that's what we really want to want to see toned down. Now, I, in my opinion, there's not a lot in Custodes that by itself is like too sucky to play against and that's one of the reasons i call out wardens because i i think it's one of the interactions that's that's a little bit annoying but i don't know if it's like game breaking uh i do think that vertus praetors and then the the bike mounted guys more generally do have that um uh, are 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 obnoxious to play against and part of it is the fact that they can you know they can fall back operate normally they have really strong synergy with emperor's chosen and i think maybe if if we're trying to to build this army to be more interesting to play against probably the first thing that we do in adeptus custodies is axe emperor's chosen uh the the faction gets much more interesting and much more dynamic if we get rid of emperor's chosen because suddenly all of the other shield hosts open up and we can start doing different builds. Um, I talked about it a little bit uh, in, in the past. I don't think I did a video on it, but we saw a list 5-0 a GT with like 30 custodian shield guard in Solar Watch. And I think lists like that are where the interesting parts of Adeptus Custodies lie. Emperor's Chosen is way too good. <laughs> And the fact that it gives you so much flexibility, especially for units like Virtus Praetors, means that there's like no reason, there's no like easy answer to those units. Um, that said, Custodies are the toughest one, I think, on, to talk about on this list because their army generally fits into the kind of dynamic that we want to what we want to play with, right? Where like, you move up the table, you take a bunch of shooting, you shoot back, and then you charge, and everybody has a fight. Except Custodians are just better at doing it that, that than your opponent. If you restrict yourselves to the the melee custodian stuff, it makes it it makes things a little bit more interesting. Um, so I think that lists like those shield guard builds that are very tanky but don't do a ton of damage are probably kind of where we want to be standing with the faction. Um, I think things with a, a very high threat range and very high resilience and the ability to fall back and operate normally are where 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 people get upset with the faction, uh, in my opinion. So like when a Virgis Praetor unit runs in the center of the table, they shoot a bunch of shit to death with uh, salvo launchers. They take a bunch of shooting in return. The Emperor's Auspice, transhuman, lose one or two guys. They get engaged, they fight, then they fall back, shoot again, charge your back line. And then like the game's over a lot of times because they've just like murdered a bunch of characters and uh, blown up a bunch of artillery pieces and you're like, well, this sucks. <laughs> what, did it, what could I have done better? Because I did, a, you know, I tried as hard as I could to kill these Virtus Praetors. Um, if the thing you're getting stuck into is a unit of, you know, foot custodians, not only are they just a big brick and you can try to avoid them because they're significantly slower than the Virtus Praetors, but like you can also um, try to pin them in different ways because they're not super fast and they're not... Um, they're not, uh, they, they can't uh, fall back and, and shoot and stuff. Bodyguard needs to go. Oh man. Hot takes from Ames over here. I think, yeah, it's, it's an interesting mechanic because I, I don't, I think in a lot of instances, it's not like, it's not too powerful, but like we we're talking about here, it just kind of sucks to play against, right? Because you're like, well, I want to interact with you, but I can't because a rule says that I can't. Uh, and if the character in question isn't doing anything, so like, you know, these wardens are standing here and they're like, hey, what's up? I'm a warden and there's a character next to me. And you're like, okay, well, I can't shoot that guy, but I can shoot the warden. Uh, or like the, the character is, you know, he's unshootable, but he's like in the middle of the table and he's, he's not threatening super far. Um, those instances are fine. But I think if it's like, you know, if, if it's the precision of the hunter... <laughs> Uh, tau, tau commander. That's when things with bodyguard get super problematic. Uh, but I can certainly understand why why people super don't like playing against that. Bodyguard unit should take damage to the character shot at. So I think the interesting thing about bodyguard, and maybe the annoying thing about bodyguard, is that we can complain again about it a lot. But as a mechanic, there are very few ways to repair it without making it... Um, without making it busted. Maybe you tie it to a stratagem. Maybe it's an activated ability. Oh, go back, go away, Harlequins. Uh, so there are, I don't know, something like that, making it more limited in scope. So it's not like, you know, everything forever. If it costs CP or something, like your bodyguard keyworded and then you can you can turn a CP on to make your characters untargetable. But if the bodyguard unit receives damage when the character is shot at, 
then that's how it worked in, in the previous edition. And because games of 40k are so lethal, that just means that the bodyguard unit and the character are dead. So the bodyguard is essentially worthless. Like, you, you might as well not have brought it. Um, I played bodyguard uh, for a hot minute in 9th edition when I was playing Tyranids. I was trying to play Tyrant Guard, you know, pre-new codex. And I was playing them just with enhanced resistance to try to make them difficult to kill. But sometimes they would, they would act as a bodyguard for my Hive Tyrants. And pretty... You know, pretty soon into the addition, the damage outputs in the game were so high that almost any army would kill the tyrant through the bodyguards. I would have, uh, I was, I played a, a, a unit of five, I think. So I had 15 ablative wounds for a hive tyrant, and they would just kill the hive tyrant through it. Uh, things in 40k are not designed to survive, <laughs> generally speaking. Um, especially if they're taking automatic damage, you don't have to r roll against their defensive profiles. And I think that is, that's the problem that Bodyguard is trying to solve. And because it's trying to solve that problem, you can't reverse the rule because then it just, it's just useless. It doesn't do anything. Uh, but I think making it a choice on your part, not just a persistent effect, is probably better. You could also, I think there's a lot of, like, uh, suggestions where you make it wholly within. You just, like, reduce its effect so it's harder to use. I don't know how much that works, but we'll see. Uh, what do I think about the bodyguard rule only working if the unit with the rule is also visible? So there's a couple of problems with that. First off, it's really easy to block your own line of sight to things, because true line of sight is a fucking nightmare. Um, so, I, yeah, I don't think that that's good. So, either the same thing happens, right? Where the bodyguard unit is dead and then the character is dead. Or the... Um, uh, or your opponent can play around it and then they just kill the character anyway and the bodyguard rule does nothing. I don't think that that's a, that that's a problem. I, I don't think that that's the, the correct solution. And that's one of the reasons the bodyguard's so tough to fix. Uh, space Marines are getting destroyed and pick on them. So we're not talking about balance today, chat. And that's one thing I want to make clear is that we're talking about things that are, we're talking about negative play experiences. We're not talking about, about balance. Um, and that's why the, that's the, the, the purpose of this video is that <laughs> is not to rebalance the entirety of the game. It's to try to build lists that are, that are more interesting and, and fun to play. And like I said before, you know, space raids are not very good right now and they're, their competitive lists are contingent on a couple of, of mechanics, but those mechanics are poster children for mechanics that are that are sort of negative play experiences. Require bodyguards to have line of sight to what they are bodyguarding. Ooh, I like that change. I think ooh, that's pretty fun. Because then it's it's still uh it's still difficult to use, or it's, you know, it's it's still reasonable to use, but you can, you, like, your positional requirement is a little bit tougher. Ooh, I like that. Obsidian 2, that's a good, that's a good suggestion. Woo. I love it. Bring back armor values for vehicles. <laughs> I do like uh, some, I mean, I I think, our, like, our, especially armor facings on vehicles, they definitely require, uh better like vehicles to be better represented mechanically in the game right you'd like you'd need to put a base underneath the vehicle that has the armor facing specifically um demarcated but i would like to see vehicle facing matter uh not necessarily for attacks i kind of like that your weapons can attack in any direction because it's like there's not so much like chicanery where you're like oh my gun is slightly askew, so it can't see. I think that's just stupid. But I do like it. I mean, it, the game is more fun when your stuff is pointing at each other, right? And right now, you're so incentivized to point away from your opponent because your guns are usually the points on your model that are more e most easily uh, exposed to your enemy, which means that you're incentivized not to point your guns at your enemy, which is stupid. Just give vehicles bases and then... <laughs> <laughs> and then make their armor facings matter. That, that, that would be better, but we'll never get it. Mikkel, hi there. Uh, greetings from Belgium. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. 
Yeah, the this uh, Nids on pre-order this weekend. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna see if I can. Uh, I'm gonna see if I can try to so snag a, a combat patrol to do a giveaway. Chat. I'm gonna see what we do. Can I repeat what I uh, said regarding competitive mechanics? Uh, uh, in regards to Space Marines. So what we were talking about was uh, the 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 goal of this video is to talk about. Um, mechanics that are negative play experiences and, and ways to avoid them, especially in the top factions of the game. What we're not trying to do is rebalance the entirety of the game right now because I, I think that's like too big an undertaking. And that's ultimately a not up to the community. So what, <laughs> we can we can whine about broken stuff all we want, but it's never it's not gonna, that's not going to change it. Um, so what we want to do here is call out some of the mechanics that suck to play against and try to build lists that don't incorporate those or try to build archetypes at least that don't incorporate those. Um, the downside of Space Marines specifically is that competitive Space Marines are predicated on a lot of those mechanics. So things like turn one deep strikes and bodyguard rules. And so <laughs> so we're not necessarily trying to, to, to rebalance the game from a competitive standpoint, but uh, as part of this discussion, Space Marines are gonna get a little bit of the short end of the stick because a lot of the things that we're gonna talk about are what they're, they're built around doing. Just tried Gunboat Hive Tyrant, the old Battleship Hive Tyrant. Most frustrating thing for your opponent, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a good archetype for a ranged character. And I do think if there was... Uh, the, the Battleship Hive Tyrant is probably... It's a good example of, of one of those characters that probably shouldn't have access to Bodyguard because it's so good at shooting and your opponent can't do anything back to it. But it's not like a huge volume of fire. So unless they have like right the correct profiles for it to shoot at, it's only six attacks. Uh, so it's not going to kill a lot of infantry or whatever. I do think that the platonic ideal of a bodyguarded character is like a melee foot tyrant. This like big, slow idiot who <laughs> just wants to get up in your face. And so uh, as we, we move to talk about Tyranids, I think that's probably one of the, the one of the best uh, combos to bring in. Finally had a closer game with the Necron player when you took a Yavara. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, taking new and interesting stuff is also good. So we talked about Adeptus Custodians. I think that these these foot custodian lists uh, that, that run a lot of the, the basic troop options are going to be the most interesting to play, uh, you know, essentially, especially against because it's a big, it's a big brick that, that's going to fight your opponent in the middle of the table. And I, and, you know, there's, there's. Not much else to it, <laughs> effectively. Uh, they're just gonna have a, a big, a big knockdown drag out fight, and that's what we, that's what we kind of want to engender. Um, we can move on to Harlequins, and I think we get sort of a similar, um, a similar discussion because uh, signs any discussion about the balance of Harlequins because clearly right now they, they're, they're super broken, right? Um, I think that the parts of Harlequins that are problematic from a gameplay standpoint are almost entirely the vehicles uh in that's that's my opinion and that might not be everyone's but i do think that if you build harlequins lists or at least harlequins detachments that are contingent on your foot stuff or your your star we your sky weavers excuse me I think that the faction gets a lot more interesting to play both with and against. The vehicles are super tough to kill and the dedicated transport mechanics, while not in and of themselves like abusive or anything, uh, I do think that some factions use them mo to more effect than other ones and Harlequins are one of those. So, you know, what you can do, for example, is like you can, you can stack your buffs on your Star Weavers, you know, touch the, the touch, central objectives or outlying objectives like no man's land objectives with those star weavers if your opponent doesn't have objective secured and they touch the objective and then they kill that star weaver you jump the opposite goddess out and you take it from them uh and and it you know few are the armies that have the the beef to actually even kill the sky weaver to start with then also having objective secured so that you don't like score 12 primaries on them is is <laughs> very difficult <laughs> uh i do think that the ways, the more interesting lists in Harlequins are, are um, probably not going to be built around those those Skyweavers, and it is a tough discussion because Harlequins are not a large, you know, they're not a deep pool of, of data sheets, and so cutting out the vehicles uh, from the faction is 
is makes it more, more annoying to build lists. But I do think that sky weavers are a good place to go, and I do think that sort of big troop bricks are, are, are a good way to go. Although their their damage output isn't phenomenal, it's not great for sure, especially now that they can't take like multi fusion pistols and stuff. But uh, I do think that it's much more interesting than just playing the dedicated transport game. Uh, the other thing that you could do is, is, is also take the not not take the long range guns, and we we just take this, the uh, the the sky weavers. Um, I would be shocked if that's not how the way the direction that things go anyway <laughs> after our upcoming data slate, but uh, we'll see how we'll see how things end up. Just bring dice and forget models all together. <laughs> yeah, just roll off with your opponent. Here you go. <laughs> how do I feel about unnerfing older codexes to deal with power creep? I do. I, I do like that idea for sure. Um, one thing that GW loves to do is they like to, you know, they, they get set in their ways, right? With their, with their nerfs. Like they release a data slate, uh, rebalance document and then they never change anything in it. And not only is that problematic from a balance standpoint with things like orcs still retaining these like insane nerfs from the release of their codex, which was problematic when it gets nerfed. And, and, and to be sure, I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure that all of the nerfs and especially something like orcs need to get rolled back, but they don't need to be like saddled with all of these like points restrictions, right? That they got six months ago that are no longer relevant because they're they're not even particularly competitively viable. They're still f they're doing okay. Orcs are like fighting the good fight. They're up there with like Necrons, like just trying to trying to squeak some by some some wins through. But it's it's a tough it's a tough place for them. I think especially factions like Sororitas and Death Guard were nerfed totally unfairly. They, ne they did never needed those nerfs <laughs> that they received, and those should absolutely be rolled back, 100%. Uh, so I, not to mention the fact that it's like, I don't know, it's pretty easy for <laughs> for for GW to, to make those changes. It's not like, it's not like those, you know, that's a game state for the codex that they we haven't seen already. Uh, right Bodyguard is the same rule in all books to fix confusion. If it is or isn't or yeah, I think that's a that's a um, a rules development problem. It is an aura, by the way, chat, because it's an ability that ha that affects models within a range. Uh, it is full stop an aura. That that is part of the confusion is the fact that the aura keyword gets tagged onto things. The aura keyword. Just so the so just so we're clear, chat. The aura keyword is functionally meaningless within the game. Things tagged aura are aura abilities, but also things that have a range and affect models within that range are also aura abilities. There are three different definitions for aura within the, the Warhammer 40k rulebook, and those are two of them. So regardless of whether or not your version of the bodyguard keyword says aura, it is an aura. Full stop. It just is. <laughs> so if you do have things that turn off auras, they will always affect bodyguard. FYI. Issue with Quince is when light and void weavers get nerfed. Dark build with a bunch of infantry is really strong and just going to be the best faction. Uh, in, yeah, that's interesting to hear. I haven't heard that, but um, that'd be interesting to see. I, we don't know what exactly is going to happen to Quince, though. We don't know if their sub-factions are going to get nerfed. I wouldn't be shocked if light gets nerfed, but I wouldn't be shocked if it turns into like a uh, melee only or something for the uh, the trains hitman effect. Mon 929 battleship hive tyrant with relic venom cannon and venom cannon versus tau shot a lot of their big things. It is good into tau profile specifically. It's a lot of like AP 3 4 damage, which is like just clears out battle suits. <laughs> oh no, the, the bots are back. Go away, bots. Get out of here, bots. God damn it. Terrible. <laughs> All right. So that, anyway, that's my that's my uh, my thoughts about Harlequins. Not a not a huge swath of uh, stuff sort of wrong with them, and I think similarly for Craft Worlds as well. Um, I actually think the only reason that I have Craft Worlds on this list is because they they they, ha they sort of have all of the poster children for these kind of uninteractive, annoying abilities, but none of them are like super strong. 
They're just good. And I think that if you want to play Craft Roads more interestingly, I, there are builds that like focus on Aspect Warriors and, tra and peace trading with your opponent. So like they'll they'll take a bunch of little five man like Striking Scorpion, Howling Banshee squads, and then they'll use those to like, you know, plus two charge, auto six a charge, like get the super long threat range out, and then nuke something and then die, and then something else will do that. And I think those are the those are, those are the interesting lists in the faction so building more for the little bomb units like you can play stuff like i think wind runners are very cool and interesting i think that uh the the melee aspect warriors especially are interesting i think guardian bombs probably have a place maybe even dire avenger bombs or especially dire avenger bombs that, that jump around and um uh, do actions and stuff are are very interesting. The stuff that is annoying to play against is the artillery and the swooping hawk stuff. Uh, I think Behareth especially, but um, to a lesser extent, the regular swooping hawks. I don't know if regular swooping hawks are, are really as much of a like they're they're just sort of annoying from like an emotional level, but they don't do that much damage to you, so they just get to like shoot you a bunch. Behareth is legitimately frustrating. Um, I don't know if he's broken he probably is a little bit so from a balance standpoint it's kind of none of this uh, this craft world stuff is is really uh in my opinion is is maybe just d cannons i guess but none of it's like you know i think needs to get nerfed or anything but i do think that if you're showing up if you're rocking up to your local game store and somebody rolls out six d cannons and a bunch of a bunch of shadow weavers you're not gonna have a very good time regardless of who wins that game nobody's gonna have a good time with it <laughs> so um that's just stuff to avoid with Craft Worlds, but I think that Craft Worlds are in a pretty good place sort of from an interesting game plan perspective because I think the lists with Craft Worlds that tend to win are going to be really interesting and creative. Um, sans the artillery. So is, if you're not playing a bunch of artillery spam, the, the faction's doing a bunch of interesting stuff. You got a, little, a lot of fast dudes. You got some alpha strikes. Um, they do have some turn one deep strikes, but their turn one deep strike uh, isn't quite as oppressive as other factions because they don't tend to deep strike super long range stuff so it's not like deep striking crisis suits on your turn one they deep strike like fire dragons maybe and those are screenable because their range is so short so um and plus their their drop pod equivalent is very expensive it's like as falcons like 140 points i think so they still have a lot of these mechanics that are obnoxious but they they don't abuse them to the same level that other factions do which means i think that most of their builds are going to be pretty interesting, uh, in my opinion. Decans are great at killing melee vehicle armies. They're off against long range armies who keep their tanks in the back. Uh, I think, I mean, that, that's potentially the case. I think that D cannons also just have like a really good threat onto relevant parts of the table in ninth edition. Um, and so if you don't have an answer to them, uh, which again is typically like. <laughs> You know these hardcore alpha strikes and aircraft and artillery and stuff like that so the uh, this stuff that we're already kind of complaining about is the only answer to d cannons so d cannons just kind of exacerbate this problem where like if you don't have a bunch of artillery what are you gonna do against the d cannon spam um a bunch of artillery or untargetable bottles that could make it up to the table against them uh then the d cannons just get to sit back and and, and most of the gt 2022 missions they can get ranged almost all of the objectives in the on the table with their move and shoot uh especially if there's like good terrain in the center and i just noticed that the <laughs> i think the cockpit on the shadow weaver is not <laughs> is not seated correctly did they misassemble this thing back in like 1986 when they made this model um <laughs> let's look at that so the um I think that the, regardless of the build of your opponent's army, there's almost, uh, D cannon platforms are going to be doing something. How do you, oh, it's called a night spinner. I think I put a night weaver and shadow spinner. Both of those are wrong. So if we, <laughs> let's look at this cockpit real quick here, chat. <laughs> so if we zoom, can we zoom this guy? Zoom this bad boy in. Enhance. Enhance. Now it's smaller. Open image in detail. <laughs> Look at this little guy. He's, uh, that's definitely not glued in there, chat. <laughs> Nice illustrator. This, uh, this is not flush with the, the rest of the cockpit here. 
in this little area. Right, right here. <laughs> and you can see that there's a gap here now because it's not glued in. That's embarrassing. <laughs> That's funny. Half the time decans are amazing, the other half throw a waste of points. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a potential uh, problem if you're, like, spamming decan and super hard. But I do, there are a lot of lists that only take, like, two or three. And those are the lists that I think tend to be a little bit more consistent because they can use the other stuff in their army to kind of make up for the problems with decans. Uh, I played against um, Ramses, who I had on stream a couple times. He actually played a decan and unit as a to the last. Uh, his army was predicated on playing to the last. And that meant that he had this, like, uh, three decans or 190 points. So it's 190 points that he can keep sort of back in the, the back of his army. He's not... It's not the end of the world if he doesn't get, su like, super good use out of them. But generally, there are stuff in range that for decans to shoot at. Um, especially if you're on an objective with with uh, sort of forward deployed... A mission with forward deployed objectives. So stuff, something like... You can imagine, like, a Tide of Conviction or one of the uh, old school sweeping clear loadouts where there are five objectives and and one's in the middle and there's two on each side and you, you deploy in the corner um your opponent has to go either go to the middle objective or go to the side objectives and d cannons can hit either of those from almost your table edge so um and then you know even if you even if they're not doing active damage to your opponent they're just giving you five points uh at the end of the game because if your opponent doesn't have the the, the stuff to deal with them and i think that those are those are probably the most efficient uses of D cannons, but there are also less that just take nine D cannons and just tries to go first. I don't think those are as uh, reliable <laughs> for sure, but I do think that they are. Uh, they're they're still they're still relatively fine. But again, we're not talking about necessarily from a, a balance standpoint. Um, if you do, <laughs> you know, if you're taking a billion D cannons and your game plan is to shoot your opponent through their walls, that's uh, gonna suck. So I think playing the more Aspect Warrior uh, focus builds, I think playing the Guardian focus builds, I think uh, probably uh, sticking to pure craft worlds and, and, and maybe only playing the, the more melee-oriented uh, Harlequins if you do that. Um, those, those do make the game more interesting for both you and your opponent. Um, if you don't have just sort of the ability to, to target, nuke, whatever you want <laughs> with your super long-range D-cannons. <laughs> That was back from when the rules allowed to pilot uh, the pilot to jump out. Um, did they? Oh, they in in third edition, right? Your your vehicles had a crew component, and if your vehicle was was destroyed but not annihilated, right? They could bump, they could pile out, and you would get them as a unit. But the 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 models don't actually have a crew model. It's just a little dude who's like glued into the seat, right? You had to like find a guardian somewhere. I did kind of like those mechanics. They were very. They're, it's kind of annoying. <laughs> you know, only Sergeant Kronos does that now, right? But they were... Um, actually, does he still? He might not anymore. That might have been an 8th edition thing. I need to... Uh, I need to check it. I need to double check this. Yeah, yeah. Sergeant Kronos does jump out. Yeah, yeah. He disembarks when his vehicle is destroyed. Good job, Sergeant Kronos. You're the best. Um, those were cool mechanics, but yeah, a little bit tough to keep track of, in my opinion. Um, does it have a clicking mechanism that lets you open and close it? I don't think so. Does it? Is it, can we see this, the clear sprue with the, uh, thing on it? I don't think it does. I think you just actually have to glue it in. That would be cool, though. Yeah, I think it just seats in there. It does have a... Um, it has, like, a peg so that you can lift it. There's a... there's it, It's supposed to slot in so you can lift it, but as, as far as I know, it never works. Um, to my knowledge. It's been a while since I assembled one of those. I think I did some for commissions back in the day, but that was it. All right, let's 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 move on. Let's talk about Tau. I know there's a lot of discussion about Tau in the uh, in the chat right now, so we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, Roger, is the topic basically a competitive or banned list? Not really. 
Um, what, what we just want to talk about is, is being able to play these these factions in a way that's fun and also not super broken, essentially. We don't, I don't necessarily want to like go down the rabbit hole of doing a ban list or something. Um, what I do want to do is uh, is kind of theory craft some ways that we can play the factions effectively, but uh, but not in a way that's like degenerate. Were older editions better balanced for mixing armor and infantry? Uh, I personally, I don't think I could tell you. I don't think that. It, I think that. Uh, I don't know if if armor versus infantry has ever been particularly balanced as much as like units are imbalanced, right? So like, there's been situations where, you know, sometimes a tank is good and sometimes a tank is bad. It depends on what the tank does. Um, and I think that's just kind of how 40k works. But I'm sure someone in the in the uh, the comments who has who has played through more editions than me could um, could uh, uh, go into into greater detail on that. Uh, SF Devilfish and Breacher Rust is honestly not that bad, and it's quite a bit more fun. Yeah, so that's what I wanted to talk about here a little bit. I think that the Fire Warrior base lists in Tau are really interesting. I will go on a hot take here, chat. I don't think, outside of air bursting fragmentation projectors, I don't think that crisis suits are problematic at all. Um, I think that, generally speaking, their guns are so short ranged. Outside of the one unit that has to strike and fade, which is again is you know is an ability you have to build for, and then also spend uh, command points on, um, and set up for. Like there's a lot of play to it. Uh, I don't. Crisis suits have to enter a range at which they fight your army in order to, uh, in, to in order to engage with you. Again, outside of the air bursting fragmentation projector, <laughs> that thing is <laughs> a little silly. Um, so there are a lot of calls out there for crisis teams to get nerfed, and I don't know if that's necessary. What I will say though is that I think that stealth battle suits in a in addition to crisis teams, are actually problematic. And again, it's a turn one deep strike effect, which is something that we're we're going to be, you know, in the 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 course of this discussion, uh, is going to be potentially a no no. Um, I think that though the the stealth battle suit plus crisis suit lists tend to engender this like big huge alpha strike, which is what people are worried about with crisis suits. Crisis suits themselves, they do have a long movement, so they can't alpha strike you if they take the combo with Cold Star Commanders. But by themselves are not like hyper degenerate or anything. But I do think that the the stealth suits into with homing beacons into a turn one deep strike is pretty annoying. And unlike a lot of the other units that we talked about, things like Falcons, you can fit relatively long range guns on them, which means they can deep strike and then shoot pretty deep into your deployment zone, even if you have screening. So I I don't think that it's it's that big of a deal. Or I I, I do think it is, is a big deal. And I don't think that homing beacon stealth suits are are the way forward. I think that they are a little bit silly. Fourth edition was weird, six fexes and leaping rippers was filthy. I did play that in fourth edition. Um, but yeah, I, I also was very new. Fourth edition was my first, my first edition. I played fourth through the launch of fifth and then I stopped and then I, and then I picked it back up again in eighth. Uh, but I played, yeah, I played Carnifexes. I never played Hive Tyrants as much as other people did. I played Broodlords usually. So I never played like the eight monster list. Cause I know that was, that was Nidzilla back in the day with six Carnifexes and two and three Hive Tyrants or two Hive Tyrants or whatever. Uh, but I never played it. This SF disagrees that crisis suits are not being not being bad. Sigler been testing a twenty crisis suit list, and it's been the only thing. And the only thing that has defeated it is Harlequins. Uh, they can become absolutely degenerate with drop zone clear through far side enclaves with an ethereal for CP battery. Um, so again, that is dependent on stealth suits dropping turn one. If you are required to do that turn two, your your opponent has a counterplay to it. Um, I think. I mean. Far side enclaves is probably is a little bit of a different uh, uh, different can of worms. I don't think it's as good as broadsides. I'm gonna be honest, chat. Uh, I think I am biased playing Crusher Stampede into it because I think Far side enclaves is like significantly worse against Crusher Stampede than broadsides are. Um, 
but a lot of times Farsight Enclave matchups with a lot of different factions, and I'm not just going to say it's just Tyranids. Farsight Enclave's matchups turn into this binary. Did you go first? Yes, no. If you went first, you drop six crisis suits in their deployment zone, drop some clear them, and kill half their army. If you didn't, they screen out like half the table and they kill all your stealth suits and then the game's over. Um, and I think stealth suits are like the crux of that. If you're just playing crisis suits and deep striking them naturally, your opponent has counterplay to it. Now, as part of this discussion, I do think that, you know, there is a little bit of onus on your opponent's part. If you if your army asks a question of your opponent and they just did simply didn't bring an answer to it, I don't think that's necessarily your army's fault. So if your army's like, hey, I'm going to deep strike a bunch of crisis suits, do you have an answer to that? And they're like, oh, I didn't bring any screening. You're like, well, you made a bad army. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you, man. <laughs> but that game plan is going to be significantly more interesting, which is really what we want to be engendering here than the things that are on this this uh, uh, slide. So first off, the Storm Surge list. I don't think the Storm Surge list is that good, but I do think that is it is very obnoxious because um, everything in line of sight of your opponent's army gets killed every turn. The, the game plan is just to hide out of line of sight and kill all of their like little chaff and stuff. And if you have a way to do that then it's fine um if your terrain sucks or your army doesn't have a way to do that it's it's shitty <laughs> and you die and i don't think that's particularly fun for either player i can't imagine i mean i'm sure there's somebody out there who's plays triple storm surge and is like this is so fun i'm having the greatest time ever <laughs> but i can't imagine it's particularly interesting because literally a, a thousand points of your army doesn't move every turn um similarly i think the broadside list is you know, despite the fact that it might be matchup dependent, two to three broadside units is just silly. I think even one broadside unit is too much. They uh, they have artillery, which is again what we're talking about being uninteractive and silly. And again, everything in line of sight gets shot every turn. Um, regardless of whether or not it's good in a particular matchup, I think that it's too strong, uh, or it's 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 too uninteractive. Um, and then the other thing, the reason I have the cold star in here is not necessarily because I don't like, I, I don't think you should play cold stars at all. But what I don't think you should play is the precision of the hunter guy. Um, because again, you can use the bodyguard keyword on this character that actually gets a lot of work done with, you know, with full rerolls, hit and wound, and on target ability from a, a crisis bodyguard unit uh, is is pretty problematic. And and I mean, maybe I should have put crisis bodyguards in here as well. I was running out of space, <laughs> but um, I think that of all of the factions that abuse bodyguard, it's Tau that are that are probably the most abusive. Um, even more so than, than Hive Tyrants, in my opinion, because their characters are, are very range focused. They have a lot of counterplay. Uh, they can like strike and fade in and out of bodyguard ranges. They can extend the range of their bodyguard effects. They, um, if they're in Tau Sept, they can pull out of melee when you charge them. So they have a lot of ways to even further, even more so than other factions that use bodyguard to stop that interaction from happening. And I think that is very obnoxious. Uh, I, it, it, it if there is one bodyguard in the game, and again, I don't, I don't necessarily think that the bodyguard role itself is too strong. If there is one bodyguard in the game that I think is too strong, it's probably Tau. Fire Tyrant. How about for indirect fire, you have to draw a line of sight from another vehicle or troop to be able to be shot? Kind of like how T-Sons do it with the Cabal thing for psychic powers. Um, I like that ability. Or I like that idea, right? I think that certainly helps make the mechanic more interesting. I do think that there are... Um, it, it might end up being too open-ended. You, I think you have to restrict it to particular keywords. So like Tyranids, for example, right? All of their indirect fire is keyed to a Synapse creature. Um, and that on the surface seems really smart. But the interaction with Tyranids is that it functionally makes you... Uh, regular indirect fire but with extra steps because you can give any any flying unit synapse essentially uh you can give a harpy synapse you can the flying hive tyrants are obviously synapse those are going to be moving aggressively forward and then using encircle the prey to pull off the table anyway which means that um it's not really a restriction <laughs> because you're just moving into line of sight of the stuff that's hiding from you and then shooting them and then removing them from the table uh the tyranny indirect fire is also really bad so <laughs> i don't know if you would uh if it like that that necessarily matters so much but i would i would caution that from being a change like wholesale to the mechanic being like ah oh, we fixed indirect fire by requiring a spotter but then if you if we see like the the 
uh, Imperial Guard Codex come out. And Imperial Guard has like a similar, like, you know, hit and run style effect for aircraft. An aircraft can spot for artillery. Then suddenly we haven't done anything, right? The, the, it's just that artillery now need an aircraft on the ta like in their army list in order to, to fire indirectly. Um, I think if it's restricted to particular keywords, so like if smart missile systems could shoot something that like has a target lock on it or is in line of sight of a pathfinder, then like suddenly we're 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 cooking with gas, right? Because a lot of your um, your army is going to have to. You know, like you're gonna have to have line of sight with particular units in your army. It's not just like kind of this blanket, whatever. Um, those that those are, I think, the fixes for indirect fire. If we're talking about specifically nerfing them, precision of the hunter enforcer with thermoneutronic and begal plate is an absurd abomination. Yeah, I, I <laughs> the precision enforcer that just like stands there and takes it, I think is a little bit of a different, uh, a different animal. It is. I mean, precision of the hunter is like <laughs> too strong, right? It's just, just it's just silly. <laughs> um, I think the more problematic part is uh, is when the character is unchargeable. That's the part that's like really obnoxious. So Tau do also have that, like they do have that marker light effect, right? Where they have to um, marker light for the sky ray to fire indirectly. But um, that's like, that's less of a, a big deal. The problem the problem in, in, in Tau isn't necessarily the, uh, the sky ray indirect fire. It's the SMS and air bursts because they get rerolls and stuff. And the sky ray just is like one shot. Hit penalty for indirect fire is a straightforward fix. Um, yeah, maybe. I mean, we probably the the problem is that I think like a minus one to hit or a or a, you know only hits on fives or whatever is a a little bit. It doesn't feel like much of a change because most of the really good indirect fire, at least in the current reincarnation of the game, uh, gets full rerolls. So like broadside battle suits and. Storm Surges, for example, both have full rerolls to hit, uh, either from the Anchor's deployment or from Shadow Sun, Shady Lady, or they're like plus one to hit rerolling ones. So if you're like, oh, I'm minus one to hit, they're like, okay, four is rerolling ones, it's whatever. So I don't know if that does enough, right? Because suddenly it's not like the indirect fire is like ineffective when it fires indirectly. It's like almost almost normal. <laughs> like it fires almost as as you know as normally as it does. Um, some I, I think I, I heard somebody say like minus one to hit can't be rerolled is it would be interesting because then suddenly that interaction doesn't happen. But um, I don't know if there is a, a really easy fix because the armies that are like then it becomes the armies that that can that can circumvent those whatever penalty you impose on them are the indirect fire armies uh, and then the the problem is sort of still present. Um, honestly, I, I think you just take indirect fire out of the game, <laughs> but <laughs> they're not going to do that. <laughs> it used to uh, like they used to have the snap fire mechanic, right? Where you would uh, you would hit on sixes with something, and and maybe they would do that. So then, like if you're hitting on sixes full rerolling, you're like, all right, well, that's like now the full reroll is actually appreciable, but. Not if they, um, uh, not if they're, if they're like, you know, if they're minus one ballistic skill or whatever. I don't know if that's, that's as much of a change as we need to, as we need to have in order to make it worse. But it, um, in the, the short term and in the context of this video, I think I, I would encourage less indirect fire to be taken. And I do think that these fire warrior lists are the the way of the future for Tau Empire. I also think, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll repeat my hot take again, right? I, I don't think that crisis suits are like the most busted thing ever. And I do think that the crisis suit builds that are like a bunch of burst cannons or a bunch of flamers or whatever that have kind of this limited range and have to engage with you in the middle of the table. I think those are the ones that you would want to be taken, not the ones that deep strike, not the ones that shoot indirectly, the ones that have to come up and engage with you. So to that point, I think that the breacher lists, the like 
you know, quad devilfish breacher teams, while they do have this really powerful alpha strike, breachers are a f are almost a melee unit because they essentially engage with you at charge range, which means that they have the capability to run in and, and stack this cool combo and, and get a bunch of rerolls and shoot you from super long range and do a bunch of damage, but they're also right next to you. So your counterattack is going to kill a ton of fire warriors. And then I think that's like, that creates this inter interesting interaction that we're trying to do. So if you're playing Tau and you don't want to continue to play this, the same, like, you know, the same gun line oriented build, I think that's that's the direction I would go in. I think another one's potentially the Kroot stuff. Um, I don't know how much, like, <laughs> how effective it will be to, like, take a bunch of Kroot carnivores and just, like, say go. But I do think that it's certainly more interesting than than uh, just relying on the big guns as well. I kind of wish that, that the Kroot side of the faction was a little bit more fleshed out. I know a lot of people called for a, like a crude supplement to get some additional profiles and stuff in. I think that would make that would certainly make it more interesting because you you then actually like actively get access to a melee focused Tau subfaction, uh, which we just don't have right now. So, I mean, we can cross our fingers for that to happen in the future so that that Tau players get access to more than one game plan. But in the meantime, um, playing this game plan where you're you're trying to engage at this short range and trade pieces with your opponent, again, I think is is the the platonic ideal of how uh, how we want Tau to play, at least from a from a community standpoint. Indirect fire could be minus one to hit and lose rerolls. I, yeah, I, I think the rerolling thing is important because like, even outside of Tau, right? Like the other really powerful indirect fire in the game is Hive Guard, at least until the new Terror Dude Codex comes out. And Hive Guard are always like plus one to hit full rerolls, exploding sixes or whatever. So, if you're like minus one to hit for a hive guard unit, you're just like, okay, I hit on threes instead of twos, and then I full reroll. So it didn't, it literally wouldn't matter. Like those guys shoot into dense cover all the time and don't even care. So I do think that you have to, you have to do something about the rerolls. And maybe it's as is it's as easy as, um, yeah, I don't know. Just saying that like weapons with indirect fire can't be rerolled. Like you know, air bursting fragmentation projectors have a rule on them, so it can't be rerolled or something. More auxiliaries is the dream, Reckless? Yeah, dude. It, they feel like... It, it's annoying because they were at the, the uh, inception of the army, right? They were like a, a core piece of how Tau uh, were designed. They were like, hey, we can make up for the deficiencies in the Tau Codex with the... Um, like with these other aliens that they can take along with them. And then they just forgot about it. And, and, and the weird part is that it's such a weird place for that aesthetic to be because the Tau stuff has such a cohesive design, right? Like, look at all these things on screen right now. They look like they're in the same army. So if you take a Kroot Carnivore and you add that into that army, it's going to break the cohesion of the army. And it's not going to look like an army anymore. It's going to look like some big robots and then this random bird guy. And you're like, what the fuck is he doing here? Um... That was a big problem that people had had issues with, uh, you know, going back to like other games. War Machine and Hordes, right, uh, was very much about this army cohesion, where all of the different factions have these like very cohesive design aesthetics, and then they introduced mercenaries, which any army could take or or a, a, a swath of armies could take. And generally, the mercenaries would do the same thing that the auxiliaries did, where they would like shore up weaknesses that the faction had, um, except that they didn't have the the same design aesthetic as the rest of the faction. And so armies, as mercenaries got better and better and more and more got released, armies got less and less cohesive. And people really got upset about it because a lot of the the, the selling point of that game was like you would pick a nation and that nation was like, you know, part of your identity. Uh, and it just got removed slowly, <laughs> slowly but surely. It just got diluted down. And that's what Tau feels like. And it's super weird that like auxiliaries are proud of this Tau, tau design because they created such a strong design ethos and then like ruined it. <laughs> so like, why can't, like Kroot would fit into an Imperial Guard army, right? Because, you know, you have like Ogren and these ab humans and stuff like that. Um, rough riders and things that don't necessarily cohesively fit, but thematically fit together. Um... And, like, if you put a Kroot into a guard army, no one would look twice. But you put it into a Tau army, and it's this weird thing that doesn't make any sense. That's a weird tangent for me to be on. I don't know why I care so much about this. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I just think I just think Kroot are silly in, in Tau armies. <laughs> um, 
But but it's and I think that's the reason that they, like GW realized like oh we got a good thing going here with the big robot people, but we have all of these like we built this whole lore around them adopting other races into their army, and we like can't I don't know we we like we forgot how to you know make it look like make it look good essentially I guess what they should have done from the get go is just like given them Tau armor right. Like, why is a crew just like a naked man? <laughs> like, why why don't crew wear clothes? Why don't we put them in fire warrior armor, dude? There's a crew carnivore. What? It's just weird that that wasn't the that wasn't the direction to go in from the the, the get go. They have football pads on. <laughs> I don't get it. I don't get it, chat. Has anyone else run Vespid? Yeah, Vespid are very competitive. Um, they're, they're good for actions. You know, you have an infantry unit that can deep strike innately that's really strong. And they're good for... Uh, they're just good damage, right? They're, they have a two-damage gun. Like, that's sick. Just being able to drop that wherever you need to and take an objective or shoot somebody off an objective. Like, they're, they're just a super good unit, yeah. I agree that Vespid are very, very, very strong. Vespid at least... Right, Vespid at least have the, uh, at least have a little bit of the Tau aesthetic going because they have like Tau, the Tau armor and the Tau helmet on the, uh, on the, what is the unit leader called? I forget. It's like a wing leader or something. What does it say? I don't remember. Um, but it's it, it doesn't go far enough in my opinion. I think they should have kitted them out with like Tau armor. They just should have just gone whole hog. Like we put, we just give them a whole a whole suit of power armor on those guys. Would have been pretty cool. I uh, a friend and I were were going through, especially the Tau Codex. It's, it's particularly apparent with the Tau Codex, but it's also with other GW stuff as well. This isn't just for Tau. Um, but one thing that Games Workshop like to do is they they sort of adapt pop culture stuff. Uh, into their game, and then they kind of they Florida K they forty Kify it, and then uh, implement it into into Warhammer. And Tau are certainly one of those, right? Because Tau were um pretty close to the release of Halo. I just what is this thing I just noticed on this guy's this guy's left side. We're, are we exploring like old, early two thousands Warhammer models? What is this thing here? Do they have this like weird sack? Or is that a, is that their tail? Is there a three sixty on this website? Probably not, right? Because it's old. That's weird. I've never noticed that before. Are they are they like asymmetric, Chad? I can't even tell. Bizarre. All right. Anyway, um. But Halo came out, right? And then, like, pretty soon after, the Tau Codex was released. And they were, and it definitely seemed like GW was like, ooh, the Covenant are a cool idea because there are a bunch of different aliens that work together for, like, you know, profits that are literally ethereals. And uh, we'll just do that, I guess. <laughs> and, then they, and then they forgot. <laughs> but the cool thing about the Covenant is that they all have, like, the same, I guess besides, like, Brutes, they all have basically the same, like, armor and stuff. Like, Grunts and Elites are very... Um, uh, are like aesthetically cohesive and then they look like they're part of the same army and they use the same weapons and they use the same the same style of, of firearms and stuff but they just forgot about they forgot how to do that <laughs> as the uh uh for for the towel their claws these things these little things right here it's only on their left side though I'm gonna look for more. Somebody with a Vespid model. Tell me what the. <laughs> tell me what that is. Vespid Stingway. Let's look it up on on on, on the Googles. I don't know why this uh this bugs me so much. That <laughs> bugs me. <laughs> uh... 
All right. I'm trying to find a, a better image of the of the of the model. So here's a uh, here's the box, the old box art. Can't really see it. Looks like a wasp singer. Well, it's not, yeah, it's not the tail, right? It's this thing that's on, it's like he's got this big nodule on his side. It looks like a, I don't know, it looks like a shoulder pad or something. But it's not a thigh. It's a third arm. Do they just have three arms? Do, do Ves are Vespa just three armed aliens? That's so wild. Have I never known this? I guess I I should uh, I should read my Warhammer forty thousand lore more because uh, I I did not know that Vespa had three arms. That's wild. They have six. Where's the fifth one, though? <laughs> oh, does he? Have, is he? Because um, like the the link the leader, right? He doesn't have one on the other side. It's only on his left side. It's not on his right side. Am I crazy, chat? Am I a crazy person? Unless it's like he's got it behind his back or something and we just can't see it. This is not relevant to the discussion that we were having. I we we <laughs> we should move on. <laughs> oh my god. All right. Anyway, chat. Let's keep talking about. Let's keep talking about the topic at hand. Um, <laughs> I hope everybody enjoyed our uh, our divergence into talking about Vespid Stingwing models. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, everyone. A bunch of people left when we were talking about that. There are six sims on them? All right. I, tr I trust you, Max Dealey. I just wish that we had uh, better pictures of the old models. I guess they, they definitely don't want to uh, to take better pictures of the like the OG models because they are they are pretty hokey. There's definitely some better Vespid models. Uh, proxies uh, out on the in the universe that you can get a hand of a hold of that's cool though i mean it does make sense that they're insectoid they have six things all right uh well the last thing i have on on my presentation here and then we can talk about some other factions if uh if people want to is uh the new tyranids so i, I want to talk about this in, in um in concert with the new tyranids because i think it's an interesting discussion and i'm sure a lot of people want to talk about tyranids so there we go how fire warriors wear one shoulder pad? Yeah, yeah, that's because that that's the shoulder that they're pointing at the target, right? Um, it makes sense that how fire warriors wear only one big shoulder pad. But the uh, the it it doesn't make sense if fire warriors had only had one arm, <laughs> right? Like that's the that's the uh, the um, corollary. All right. So, I I don't know if I I I, I can talk so much about the new uh, Tyranny Codex in terms of like the the interesting armies that you should play. I think maybe the Gantt spam army is a pretty good one. Like if you take a bunch of Hormigants with the um, pregame move ability and then you just run them at your opponent. That in some in some situations has the ability to be really strong, but it also again it engenders this conflict where you're not playing this uninteractive game plan. You're just throwing your army at your opponent. I don't know if it's particularly good. But I also think it is it is much more interesting than, for example, taking a bunch of Tyrant Guard and hiding your your uh, Hive Tyrants behind it, which is a little bit lame and probably one of the you know it's it's probably number two on the on the most abusive uses for the Bodyguard rule. Uh, not that Tyrant Guard can do anything else. It's not like we we choose to you know we pick out of the the litany of Tyranid characters and choose to Bodyguard Hive Tyrants because they don't work on anything besides Hive Tyrants. But uh, I do think that it creates this. 
very uninteractive game state, which is, well, again, what we're trying to avoid. The other thing that I think is, um, you know, potentially a, a feel bads is the Malice Scepter combo. Um, the fact that it shoots through, through walls, especially, so that there isn't really a way to hide from it is problematic. I don't know if it's quite as bad as... Uh, it's, it, it, I don't know if it's like, you know, it's not quite as bad as like actually shooting a gun over a wall, right? Because it only affects you at a very short range and it only, it requires a lot of setup to do. So it's not like it just automatically goes off and, and you, you, you know, the thing happens. Uh, if, if it's ground pounding, which is when the pulse is the most uh, effective, then you can shoot at it, right? So it's just the thing that's gonna be running at you and has a relatively, like reasonable threat range but it, and if it's not hiding it's out in the open and you have a turn to try to kill it um the other way to to deploy it is with a tyrannocyte and again i think tyrannocytes are a pretty poopy mechanic um as much as they're very good um and they're they're also very expensive so you pay for how good it is i i from a fundamental standpoint i don't think that turn one deep strike should be in the game and i think that they're a very annoying mechanic to play against because again a lot of armies don't have either good or even at all access to forward deploys, which means that a, if a, a player with a drop pod mechanic gets to go first, they just drop on you and there's nothing you can do about it. So they get kind of free reign to do whatever they want. And and that sort of alpha strike is is too good. Um, I also think that for a, you know all of the reasons we talked about before, I think harpies are probably the number one unit to avoid if you're trying to like create a very interactive Tyranid list. Even if you want to take like you know Tyrant Guard and Hive Tyrants, you can take Hive Tyrants that don't have these like long sort of uninteractive threat ranges. So stuff like Flying Hive Tyrants, they they shoot themselves super far and then they overrun back to their Tyrant Guard or they encircle the prey every turn. And the the shooting Hive Tyrants just kind of stand there and they shoot six times. But if you wanted to take like a foot Hive Tyrant with melee weapons and run them up the table and protect them with Tyrant Guard, I think that's interesting and cool. Especially since a melee Hive Tyrant oftentimes has to expose itself to your melee threat range before it's itself in range so uh it's significantly less effective than than the longer range versions um so that's more defensible i think than the harpy the harpy is like it's uninteractability personified it's super fast it's hard to to kill um it can't be charged if it's not in hover mode and it has a mortal wound effect so oftentimes it can even hit you when it's not in line of sight plus it gets double pivots so you you, you can't even try to like screen it out because it's so maneuverable that it can pivot around the table um or it can just hover mode uh so there's very little there's very few ways to actually deal with it either before it hits you or after it hits you depending on your build and then even then it has access to a circle to pray so it can leave so i would uh if you're if you're not trying to build like the most competitive list ever i would i would certainly leave leave uh, harpies at home the other ones are maybe a little bit more defensible but um that's the one that i think is a little bit silly just run Crusher Stampede, Flank Edema. Oh, I think this, this is, uh, assuming that this is the new codex, so we're assuming that Crusher Stampede is not legal. Um, because I, I have a sneaking suspicion that it won't be. Dan Jones, always pleased that, uh, when you play a balanced force, a mix of infantry, tanks, fast units, it feels real. Yes. I, uh, I think that that's, that's very much of a, uh, you know, the, the, a good direction to go in, especially, because those armies tend to be pretty interesting as well. Um, one thing that, like I said at the top of the video, one thing that I think is still important is, is building an army that's functional. Um, again, uh, you know, speaking personally, I don't think it's particularly fun to play an army that doesn't have any interesting synergies in it. And as your opponent, if you're, you know, if your opponent rocks up to the table and has an army that doesn't do anything, you're like, what are you, what are you here for? You know, <laughs> um, but I do think that there are armies where you can create, you can build in like little components of, of combo. So you'd be like, all right, we got, we have like a, you know, our tech Marine plus our, our, our you know, two dreadnoughts or whatever to like be our backline sh shooting support. And then we have like our apothecary with our like one, you know, frontline melee unit. And you, you build in those little modules and you, and you mix and match rather than just going ham into one of those combos. Uh, Donald Cowie question, how good is the patrol box for Tyranids and what would I buy next? Um, unfortunately, I think the patrol box is very bad. <laughs> um, they leaned really heavily into Termagants and Termagants are the, one of the worst units in the codex. 
Um, so I think that from a from a, a collection efficiency standpoint, I would I wouldn't touch thick patrol box with a ten foot pole. Unfortunately, um, I would start with uh, with warriors. I would start with hive tyrants. I probably uh, probably tyrant guard, and then you can sort of push out from there. So the, I think the core of a lot of tyrant lists, if we're talking about competitive play, the core of a lot of tyrant lists is going to be tyrant guard, one to two hive tyrants, or probably two hive tyrants. Um, two units of warriors to build out your two patrols, and then probably zone throws and venom throws from there. So if I were to start Tyranids today, I would buy warrior boxes, I would buy throp boxes, so the venom throw, zone throw box, and I would probably buy high turns. Um, I, I wouldn't, unfortunately, the, the Termagants are just dead weight in that, in that combat patrol box. And it's really unfortunate because they were sort of put, they were pointing towards be like, hey guys, hordes are really good. Check out this box with a bunch of models you can get. They're terrible. They're terrible. <laughs> uh, too bad. Who has a harpy? Um, I just printed one. I finished it the other day. I'm very excited about it. I don't have a base for it yet. That's I have to buy a base for it. But um, they are they're sold out everywhere because they came off the back of being very playable in Crusher Stampede. So a lot of people bought them for Crusher Stampede, and then also they became like the best unit in the Codex. <laughs> in the new codex as well so they they went from strength to strength essentially um i didn't think i never liked them in crusher stampede particularly but a lot of people were playing them very competitively at a high level i think tyrannicide is fine when used with a toxic green and chronos yeah it, it, it does depend on what you're dropping if you're dropping melee stuff out of a toxic of a tyrannicide then then like that's different than than dropping like zoanthropes and um, you know, uh, uh, Malice Scepters and big shooty stuff. But, um, so I, I think, like, yeah, if you want to drop a Toxic Green and then do, like, a turn one charge combo on that, I think that's a lot different. Maybe a, a, a Haro Specs. Maybe we drop a nice little Haro Specs out of that guy. But you can, you can set up to get a pretty big charge bonus, right? You can, like, you can play a Lictor. You, you push the Lictor super far forward. Um... And then you uh, shard lure the guy, so he's plus two to charge, 3d6 drop the lowest. So it's a really, really reliable charge out of deep strike. And if you want to do that with a Tyrannicide, I think that's a lot more defensible than than dropping the really impactful stuff out. But again, there's very little that your opponents can do about it, so it kind of is what it is. Uh, patrol box is three warriors and a tyrant. Yeah, uh, so I think that patrol box is going, for, at least in the U.S., for $150, and three warriors and a tyrant are like 90. So you, you're you're paying $60 for termagants you're never going to use. So like, I don't think that's particularly worth it. If you're just trying to get into the game, that $60 could be, you know, another set of warriors and a half. Ninety codexes also need to do a better job offering multiple play styles for armies, rather than having one build that completely blows out every other build. Yeah, I think that's a that's that's more of a data sheet problem, um, because like a lot of times one data sheet will be like just super busted, and then that becomes the, the the build. I do think that if out of all the codexes recently, the Tyranid Codex is probably the best for that. So like in Custodies, right? Like Virtus Praetor is too good in. Um, Tau, like uh, Broadside Battlesuit's too good. I think that Tyranids, the best list you're going to find is like a one of a bunch of different things. It's going to be like a toolbox build that all goes together. Part of that is Synaptic Imperatives. I think Synaptic Imperatives are a really cool addition to the toolbox. And I think part of it is that the, the internal balance is pretty good. Although the, the external balance, you know, who knows? <laughs> it might be a little strong, but we'll see. <laughs> Sixty dollars is a box of thropes. Yeah, I would much rather have a box of thropes than a bunch of a bunch of termagants that I would never use. Do gants become playable if you run triple turvagon? Uh no. No, I would not play triple turvagon. The problem is that there are very few armies in the game that will have trouble killing all your termagants. Um, I mean, you can like pump their defensive abilities like as as far as you as hard as you can, right? But so like you can zone throw. Uh, imperative them for a five plus invuln. You can make them stalwart with Leviathan, and then you can minus one to hit them with Venom Thropes. But you're still paying uh, for a unit of thirty. You're paying two hundred and ten points, and this unit is not going to do appreciable damage to your opponent's army. So 
you know, plus all of the support that you just put into that, which to be fair, you're going to have anyway. Um, and then in a lot of situations, your opponent is still going to be able to remove them all in one go. And, and if, if that's the case, you're putting all of these points into these units that don't have any offensive power and your opponent has, your opponent can remove wholesale. Um, which is, which means that you're also then paying 600 points for turbogons that aren't doing anything. I think maybe you take, you play one turbogon and I think turbogons themselves are a defensible pick. Um, I think that the, the big termagant build is going to be probably, is, is going to be, have a tough time competing though. Dropping 10 gene stealers, elixir and a tyranid prime. If you fail a charge, you still move three, putting you within six for the Lictor strat. Uh, well, you uh, you have to be outside nine inches of opponents, which means that you're basically 9.1 away. So a Lictor moving three would would be still be 6.1 away from the from the target. So I don't think that that works mathematically. I think you have to like. You have to like just be running the lictor forward basically and hoping for the best. You could do it in Kraken best, I think, because the lictor can you can you can synaptic lure so that you get a reroll to charge, and then you can auto advance six the um the lictor itself so it moves eighteen. Um which isn't that far now that I'm thinking about it. It's probably not good for a turn one charge for the lictor the lictor combo. I don't know how, yeah, I don't know how you would get a turn one charge out of it. Uh, I guess you would just, you would just hit the charge of the Lictor first. There you go. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> you can shard lure. The shard lure affects everything. And then you're like, you, you, then you can, you can get on in there. Nine Gants seemed like they just existed to da daisy chain synapse buffs. Well, they, the the Gants didn't. They never synaptic linked. Um, you would daisy chain them to get their defensive abilities. So like you would, you could play them in uh, Leviathan. So they got a six up damage ignore, and then they within three inches of a Malanthrope, they would get minus one to be hit. And so you would daisy chain them back to the Malanthrope. But at five points a model, that's a much more effective strategy than than at ten points or than at seven points a model. Um, because that unit, like again, that unit's not going to do anything to your opponent. Like you can give it plus one to hit and rerolls, uh, but what they're going to be doing is running to objectives, and then if they run to objectives, your opponent can charge them, so they'll kill the whole unit, and you'll you'll just have like scored stranglehold or whatever, and then you lose two hundred and ten points of <laughs> of <term against. laughs> It there are it is like a it's a question list. Um, and I mean, it is a list that I think is probably pretty interesting. Like, if we're talking about lists like this that are that you know they they have a game plan and they can execute it, but they're not necessarily the most competitive thing ever. And I think the Termagant list is pretty good at that. Um, it asks your opponent the question of whether they can kill thirty Termagants in a turn, and if they can, then you lose probably. And if they can't, then you suddenly have a game. Um, and most armies right now can because 40k is so lethal most armies can especially because of the blast rule i think the blast rule is what kind of sends it over the edge uh and they 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 definitely tried to like circumvent it they have like the jormungandr ability where you can you can uh, count as half models for blast keyword but that should have just been an adaptive ability change my mind that anybody could take done to i play uh eldar aspect warriors in seventh and eighth not sure if the meta has decided that built-on aspect warriors is good yet. Um, as all forces on Harlequins. So I think that the uh, I played against the built-on aspect warrior list the other day, and I think it was pretty good. Uh, I think that if the focus shifts from like Ulthway and Harlequin stuff, I think that that list is a it's a strong contender. I think it's an interesting list, and it's certainly really cool. Um, I would put that up in a in you know, like a, in a tier list of like you know sort of. Tier two, very cool builds. I think that's that's up in there, um, which would probably be, be uh, would probably have been an interesting discussion for this video. I did not have enough time to put more sides together, but I think that's that's a good, that's a good one. Uh, Eldar Aspect Warriors, and, and as we're talking about sort of interesting um, builds for each of these factions that we can consider, I think the the Aspect Warriors build was a good one. I think the Breacher build is a good one for Tau Empire. I think the Shield Guard build is a good one for um, 
custodies. For Tyranids, I don't know, like maybe the, the the warrior bricks I think are interesting, where you just take a billion warriors and run up the table. I think that's a that's an interesting one. A little spammy. I think Carnifexes are a, are a good uh, example of this. Um, I don't think that they're as powerful as like the more balanced list, but they're certainly like very aggressive, and they're they're pretty they're very strong as well. Um, I think uh, for Harlequins, we talked about the dark build a little bit. That takes a bunch of troops. But again, the, the you know, overarching theme of these is that they focus on ground units that are very aggressive and up in your face. And then they, they in, invite this fight. And that's the kind of army that we want to be building. There are other things that you can, that you can play that are interesting. Um, I know personally, I'm like, I'm, I'm taking some time to play Harry Dan. Uh, before the current Tyranid Codex gets overwritten, so um, I, I don't know if I would put him in this uh, in this this list of uh, Arby's that. Muted myself. Um, Harry Dan certainly has the effect of, of sometimes just like crushing my opponent if he goes first, but uh, I, I think those are the kind of armies that we want to be talking about. Nerf devourers keep all options at five points per model. Yeah, I think there's a they're interesting. They're an interesting choice at five points a model because then suddenly you have this like you, you actually then have a um uh a unit that's like a troops option that's really cheap and, and efficient. But yeah, nobody asked for seven point per model. <laughs> Turn <Tyranid> regains. <laughs> Very silly. Nine screamer killers is nasty for sure. Biovores are awesome. One unit of three just to spawn. I guess. I don't know. They do spawn. I mean, if you roll hot, they spawn a lot of uh, spore mines because they shoot D3 each. And then on your on your Malice Scepter Imperative turn, it's kind of sick. But they're expensive, though. <laughs> 135 points. It also depends on what you're playing against because if your opponent has ways to get around the spore mines, you're just like, blech. And, and it also, I think the spore mines depend a, a, a great deal on how that um, codex gets FAQ'd because it seems like the intention of their rule is that you cannot move block, you can't move block with them, um, but that's not how it works functionally right now. But we'll see, we'll see how that goes. There's a lot of open questions in the Tyranny Codex. All right, so if uh, as we're as we go to go and ramp up here, if are there any other factions that people would like to uh, to talk about with this these uh, this kind of criteria in mind? What kind of builds can we can we focus on that aren't necessarily this like top tier of competitive play, but but are also interesting and cool? Um, is, are there any honorable mentions that we should that we should talk about? Have I talked about community patches at all? Yeah, we're not really uh, we're not really doing community, you know, comp right now. We're not. It's not really what we're going for. Can we get a plague marine point reduction? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, you could just play regular death guard. That's a good way to play a, a non-standard army. That's still pretty okay. I I, I got uh, I played against death guard with Crusher Stampede the other day. I got I got pooped on, <laughs> which is pr appropriate for death guard, I think. Uh, my opponent has some really good dice, but I was also like that. That matchup's actually much harder than I considered it to be, because um, you have to de you have to deploy very defensively. They have the really good indirect fire. The um, if they can convert their entropy cannons, which is a little bit questionable sometimes, they can do a ton of damage to you. And if they fit Mamon in there, although they break contagions, I think if they do, then they get rerolls on those guys, which is pretty good. If planes can move, back, my, my, why not mines? Well, planes can't is the problem. Is is the thing. You can move into and out of plane engagement ranges, but you can't do that for mine. But you can't do that for mine, so mines will block you with their engagement range. Yeah, so Playbird Crawlers and are, are are very good, and and in that particular game, Mortarian was very good. I think, it, and I think that's probably because I was playing Crusher Stampede. So a lot of my army was like strength eight guns and uh, like rerolling hits and wounds on stuff. And he's like, no, 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 no. We don't do that here. <laughs> so my whole army was like, uh-oh, what do we do? Boss, what do we do? And then he made like a big 10 inch charge on turn one and blew up a high roll. And I was like, uh-oh, scary. How do we make guard fun? Um, 
So I think guards a guards a good question because I think they they have a lot of these mechanics where we sort of want to avoid, right? Where you're like, uh, well, we, we don't really want to take aircraft or artillery, which are two of guards like big things. Although their aircraft's kind of poopy. Um, but they also don't do big fights in the middle. I do think that uh, you know, like Talarn tank commanders being able to move and shoot, while it is kind of this uninteractability uh, un thing, it's still interesting and it gives you something to do and their range isn't particularly long so it's not like they're going to be shooting you from thousands of miles away um and then you support that with the with the infantry blobs one thing that i played against and i talked about it in uh one of my tournament recaps a couple weeks ago was i played against the death corps of krieg army and here's the cool thing about death corps of krieg that people might not know um i think oh, did i do i have this list i built a list with them it was a little bit meme -y and i i souped in uh, Ast or, uh adeptus custodius which is uh maybe a little bit of a faux pas um, there it is. I built a list for a discussion we were having, but check out this list chat. Uh, I wasn't sure what to take on, on my, uh, my battalion detachment here. So I took a gunnery expert spotter detail. We have two, the two tank commanders with demolishers. Um, these could easily be to learn. And I think I like to learn, especially from like, I don't know, on a personal level, I like to learn because you get to move and you get to shoot and then move. And that's fun. And that's one of my favorite things. So um, maybe maybe that switches to Talar and we take a bunch of tank commanders. We then unlock chimeras in this detachment. And the reason that that's important is because of something that I talked about in a Rules You Get Wrong video relatively recently, uh, where the GT 2022 only one selectable subfaction keyword rule only applies to units that have selectable subfaction keywords. Stuff with locked subfaction keywords can uh, remain locked reg and can be taken alongside a selectable keyword. So we want this attachment so we can open up Chimeras because Chimeras have the bracketed regiment keyword, which means they get whatever regiment they're in. However, Chimeras can embark any Astra Militarum infantry unit, which means you can take them out of other regiments which means if we take a death core of krieg detachment death core of krieg is a locked subfaction keyword um which means that as long as we take only death core of krieg in that detachment we can take it alongside our existing regiment and fortunately for us death core of krieg have their own hq choices so we don't have to take any vanilla uh imperial guardsmen in there and that is to unlock combat engineer squads. And I played against combat engineer squads uh, a couple weeks ago, and they are fucking awesome. <laughs> so uh, this is like an example of a, of a very cool list for Astro Militarum. We're not focusing on the artillery. We're not trying to... Oh, no, the bots are back. Get out of here, bots. Go away, bots. Um... So we're not focusing on like the artillery or the big long range guns. What we're trying to do is maneuver combat engineer squads into range to get to do um, uh, grenadiers and they all get to throw poison grenades on people because the bass, the gas bomb grenade is absolutely ludicrous. It's two plus poison AP two, which means it's like if, as long as they've they've used their transhuman already, it just like cuts through like custodies and tyranids and stuff like that, um, unless they're transhuman tyranids. But you can also, if, if, if they're worried about, um, uh, like, the, strate the transhuman stratagem, you can just shoot them with demolisher cannons and try to force out their, their transhuman early. And then, once the transhuman's used, their combat engineer squad gets to go absolutely apeshit on somebody. Uh, it's, like, pretty awesome. I, if, if we want to make Death or uh, Astro Militarum really cool, I think that's the way you do it. <laughs> what if the hot girls and boys have good points yeah should we go check out their video chats in case they have any thoughts on on how to play like non-standard 40k armies that are really effective <laughs> kd and conscripts plus white shields i think yeah that's also the big conscript builds is also pretty uh, pretty good as well um again like it's this big horde army that's going to run up the table i don't know if you know how, it's probably relatively good right because they get a stall ward effect so they can't be one of twos um but uh, there are a lot. There's so many blast keyword and stuff. I, I'm just, I'm always worried about taking like a billion models of the table. I get blown up. Uh, orc hyper shooting build. That's just, you just play speed mob, right? <laughs> right, chat? <laughs> just speed mob things. Um, I, I think, I do think that orcs have two relatively functional armies. Those being the, the speed wah and the, um, 
or the speed mob and the the like kill rig army. I played against the kill rig army yesterday actually, and it was a, it was a very fun game. Uh, I did go first, which is a big deal in that matchup, but um, ended up being relatively close because I had a couple bad turns where I didn't do enough damage to the kill rigs and stuff, and uh, Gasgul Thraka almost ripped my, my entire army apart. Very fun game. You can go check that out on the Twitch actually if you're a subscriber. Highly recommend. It's a super fun one. Do I think that Chaos will still be able to soup without major penalties in the new codexes? Uh, I think they'll they'll still receive major penalties for sure. Whether or not those penalties will be able to overcome the the bonus the, the benefits that they get from souping, I don't know. Um, I think that they probably will, because that's how they're working currently. Like you still take uh, there's a um, a Chaos soup list going around right now that's that's playing Plague Burst Crawlers alongside Mammon, and then you take like Chaos Space Marine stuff as the core of your army, backed up by some demons. And I think that those lists, uh, because the interaction between all of the different components um, are so strong, you don't care so much about losing. Like, you lose Contagions off the Death Guard stuff. Uh, currently, you don't lose anything. And you lose um, Loci off of the Demon stuff. But currently, you don't care so much about those just because of how the army operates. Did we talk about sisters, well-balanced lists, and internal balancing? Yeah, I, I mean, f from... <laughs> that might be because sisters <laughs> are kind of bad right now, right? Uh, I, I do think that sisters have a lot of interesting builds, but that's because I don't know if any of their units are, like, per like stand out particularly, because they're kind of... Hmm. <laughs> they keep getting hit by points nerfs. <laughs> Miss old custodians with the five plus of vulnerable save, yeah, with the uh, the old uh, Vexilla Defensor. Yeah, it's sad that that hits only custodian units now, but it does make sense that they they do want to like cut down on souping quite a bit. Um. Well, anyway, I hope that was uh, I hope that 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 uh, Astro Militarum uh, discussion was good because I'm after my uh, my opponent told or after I played against that army, my opponent told me about that. I was like pretty excited about it. We unfortunately we had the. Uh, we had the um, uh, misfortune of playing it on playing the matchup on uh, Data's Cry Salvage, which is very first turn dependent, and I ended up going first. But I do think it would have been actually a pretty close game if if my opponent had gone first, especially because like those Grenadiers, I don't have a good way to interact with them. Playing Crusher Stampede, I could try to shoot them with Hive Guard, and maybe I get one a turn, not even a whole unit a turn with a double tap on Hive Guard because they're inside the other regiment's Chimera. And then you shoot the Chimera. If it hasn't smoked, maybe you kill it. And then you have to double tap to kill the unit. So you have to double, spend two CP and all of your Hive Guard shooting to kill like, like, what, like two, two, 140 points of like models, 160 points maybe. Um, not super useful. It's not a good. That's not a. It's not a particularly good exchange. And if you're not doing that, the Grenadiers just murder <laughs> Crusher Stampede monsters. So you will just die. <laughs> Um, that, that unit's super, super strong. Miss old custodies before they destroyed the meta? Yeah. It was interesting because they, custodies were already, like, playable, right? Before their new codex came out. Like, pe people still played them, and they still podiumed GTs, and they still occasionally won. There was, like, double Telemon lists that people were playing. There was, like, the Sagittarum and, like, Shields Bam lists that people were playing. They souped into other armies really well, so Imperium soup was really good. Um, and then the new custodies were just like, what if everything was better significantly and did a million more damage and was cheaper? I don't know. It is what it is. But I think we'll go ahead and uh, wrap up the discussion there, chat. I think this was a really interesting conversation. Uh, I wasn't really sure what else to talk about. I didn't really want to talk about like more competitive stuff because you know we just get to talk about Harlequins destroying the metagame. But I think that discussing ways that we can take these really powerful armies and still have fun playing them in a less competitive format is is still a really important consideration because outside of the upper echelon of 40k the vast majority of games that get played in 40k are going to be these more casual games and what we don't want to do is create this understanding that if you're playing one of these factions, like you might as well not show up because you're just going to steamroll your opponents and there's nothing they can do. The The goal is to play armies that are, are more interesting than this upper upper crust of the, uh, of the, um, the competitive game. 
Green Knight Terminators, please? <laughs> that one I don't know, chat. <laughs> I think Green Knights are probably fine with their current builds. Uh, Terminators need a little something-something. I, I, I did play against the Paladin list uh, a, a couple weeks ago, but I wasn't super in, in, uh, impressed by it. Paladins are... I don't know. From a casual standpoint, Paladins are probably fine, but I don't love them. I think that I don't like that they lose their Brotherhood keyword. It makes the, the unit, like, anything that removes synergy from your faction really kind of frustrates me. And that includes things like core keyword. But also, these units, like, that <laughs> that don't have sub-faction keywords and stuff, you're like, what are you doing? Like, that's that's half of the, the fun of list building is trying to, like, use the sub-faction keyword to the best of its ability. And you just have these units that don't, like, interface with that at all. <laughs> it's very stupid. Um... But I think I, I I think you like you can you can back up kind of a standard Grey Knight build if it's like double or triple Nemesis Dread Knight with like the thirty or forty infantry like maybe you sub some of them out for Grey Knight Terminators I don't know if I would take like all Grey Knight Terminators and I don't think I would want an army to to be forced to take all Grey Knight Terminators um, I think that's probably still fine yeah they're just too expensive right champ just too expensive. Deathwing Tyranids in Leviathan. I played Deathwing Tyranids on stream the other day and I got <laughs> eviscerated. I was, <laughs> I was, I'm unimpressed by the Leviathan uh, warrior spam. I lost 14 in the shooting phase and I was like, oh, this army's not that good. So, mm. if it, uh, if you can't, if you can't stand up to a, to a shooting phase going second, it's probably not really worth playing. There are going to be a lot of armies that have trouble dealing with it, but. Um, some of them won't. And I mean, it is a skew list. That's just like how skew lists work. Uh, but I think that that's going to be a lot of people's experience. There'll be like two games in my RTT. My opponent couldn't kill 40 warriors and I steamrolled them with bone swords. And then in the other game, my opponent killed all of them in one turn. <laughs> and you're like, okay, cool. Well, <laughs> fuck me, I guess. <laughs> all right, chat. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and close out the discussion there. Thanks everyone for watching. Remember to tune in for third on Thursday. Uh, that's going to be Craft Roads versus Tyrions once again. Um, I had some requests last week for uh, some video topics about the new Tyranid Codex, specifically talking about stratagems. I think I'm going to try to tackle that this week, which should be an interesting discussion. And um, I hope everyone enjoyed this discussion. It was a little bit, a little something different, but uh, hopefully we'll be back to our regularly scheduled uh, uh, like battle reports and stuff. Um, next week. I do have a tournament coming up this week. I'm going to play Harry Dan. I've been playing Harry Dan in the T5 SGGT, and uh, I think the list I have is pretty cool. It's got a Moloch in it, which I think people are excited about. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. Harry Dan's pretty sweet. I, I want to get my games in with uh, with full power Harry Dan before he gets uh, he gets significantly depowered in the new codex. <laughs> E-Tommy, greetings from Bavaria. Well, greetings to Bavaria, E-Tommy. Thanks for coming and hanging out. And thanks everyone for, for chilling with me. I really appreciate uh, everyone who comes in and hangs out on these streams. I'm glad that uh, they've been so popular. So, um, All right. With that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, <laughs> sign off before the webcam bots come back. Get out, webcams. How many bots do you have? Stop it. Stop making new bots. Uh, all right. And that's going to be it. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Have a good one. And uh, remember to keep it classy, folks. And have happy wargaming until...